Okay, can everybody see that okay? Yeah, we see it. Okay, yeah, I'm just letting people in here. And okay. All right, so I'm just gonna keep this view for now. Um, so I can keep, you know, we can keep managing people. All right, guys. So I'm actually gonna keep this view here. Uh, let me just try. All right, you guys can see that okay? Excellent. All right, guys. So welcome. Um, we are recording today. So um, I, I, you know, I don't have the luxury of having my great friend Hisham to, to help me out on this. Next time I will for our next meeting, but I'd like to welcome you guys all today. Um, so I just wanted to go through today's agenda. Obviously, we have a lot of new members today. Normally, our group consists of about 60 doctors. Um, we probably have added, just because of the COVID, I've allowed doctors to join in just on the group chat. And as a result, you know, why not share the webinars as well? Um, so I hope you guys all enjoy it for those of you who are new. Um, so just talking a little bit about our sign-in and see information. We're also going to go through um, just the member case review, which we always do. We always typically review, um, you know, one case um, or questions or cases. Um, so that's what we're going to do. I'm just going to reduce this a little bit. Okay. And then we're going to go ahead and go through our um, uh, implant surgical complications topic. We'll go through some of the upcoming surgeries, which we don't have, okay, <laughs> uh, which we will have eventually. And then we're going to talk about our final meeting that we have. So that would be our seventh and our final meeting for the year. Um, this one was supposed to be our final meeting, as many of you know, but uh, unfortunately, because of the situation, we've kind of pushed things out. So uh, we do have, um, so we're not going to do C evaluation forms. What I do want everybody to do is just in the group chat, if you can do me a favor, and just type your name and email address, and I'm gonna actually take a snapshot of the chat. And then um, this will be eligible for C credits. We're gonna issue, I'll issue through Odin, um, category two points for all of you who are there, okay? So just make sure you type your name and your email address um, in that, uh, and then that way I'll have that good record, okay? And for those of you who are joining us just as they join, we'll kind of let people know. So we have actually today's meeting and then one more meeting left for the year. Um, and that's going to be on May 27th. We pushed that back, um, which is going to be on soft tissue grafting. It's just going to be an overall um, low level type of thing. I mean, some of you are already doing it, but we'll talk about that shortly. So uh, feel free to visit the website. Um, also, we have an events calendar. Normally, this is where we post the surgeries that we're actually that I'm actually doing in my office. You can come and observe the surgeries as a member. And, as we're, and also it will post the meetings as well on this, um, on this site too. Uh, just make sure that you do, when I do send out an email to confirm, we don't need confirmation now because basically we're just doing this on webinar, but normally I do need confirmation um, because we want to know how many people are coming, ordering food, all that type of thing. Now we do have a group chat. Some of you have gotten already about a thousand emails from our group chat, so uh, my apologies, but ultimately, um, this is our forum, our group chat forum. Um, it's really kept myself and a lot of the other doctors alive. We've shared a lot of things. We had a huge group discount buy through Surgically Clean Air. Um, so those of you who benefited as members, um, you're welcome. <laughs> okay. And so I hope you guys enjoyed all that. So basically we've got, um, also make sure you check out the Facebook and the uh, Instagram page. Like us, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of cases on those sites that I think can benefit really everybody. Um, and it really takes you through a step-by-step. -step. So we've got, obviously we have sponsors, you know, we've got uh, many sponsors who help to support our program. And uh, what I wanted to do um, in particular, is just take you through some of the ones that do support our program. Number one is Denmat. Um, I do lecture for them on soft tissue management. Uh, for those of you who haven't attended that seminar, it's a great seminar for the team and building your hygiene. Um, also, they've made an implant kit for myself. So it just keeps things very simple, about 10 or 12 instruments. And it's the same kit that's being uh, made. Uh, it's actually made by Hartzell. Um, also, we've got Shaw Lab has been an amazing supporter of our, um, of our group. And they've been able to really lock in some amazing pricing for us, even though a lot of labs are seeing price increases. Their customer service, their quality of care has been second to none. And yes, those of you who are using HiOS and we still have an exclusive member discounts. For those members, Shaw has your names. You just write on the prescription. You're an Odin member. 
and uh, they will confirm that and then you get that pricing. So I just wanted to introduce Mike. I know we have Ali as well here, uh, but Mike just wanted to, I wanted Mike just to say a few words just from Shaw. I know you guys haven't touched base with everybody them for a while. So Mike, go ahead. Oh, hi everyone. Good to see some of your faces. Um, hope you're all surviving the tough times that we're going through. I, I've been following along on the emails over the last month or so, so I can see, uh, I can see that everyone's um, itching to get back to it and get back to practicing dentistry. Um, at Shaw, we are sort of on a wait and see pattern. Um, all of our labs are currently still open. Um, they're sort of being overseen by the lab managers and they're there to answer the phones and answer questions. Um, we're not producing any product at the moment, only for emergency uh, type cases only. Um, obviously, you know, our technicians aren't in the buildings because there's no work to be had. Um, but we're pretty much ready to go at a moment's notice. So once you guys are back to it, we'll be back to it as well. All our technicians are itching to get back to work. All our staff are getting, are itching to get back to work, um, just like everyone else is. So, um, we are still here to support you obviously, and, uh, we are ready when you are. So, you know, it's good to be back in this sort of environment. Um, I know the, the Odin sessions are, are good for everyone, us included. So, um, you know, we're just happy to be here. Thank awesome. You. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I know you guys have been a great support. And, um, and ultimately, you know, it's just nice to know you guys are still there, still doing your thing, and we'll be there for us when we get back as well. So that's great. Thank you. Um, so ultimately, um, I did want to just go through, Hi Austin obviously is also, um, you know, um, you know, uh, Hang on, let me just do one thing here, guys. Uh, okay. Yeah, so uh, Hi Austin has been there. We've been doing some lectures for Hi Austin as well. I uh, had a sinus lifting uh, session with them. Uh, my office manager, actually, uh, Karen, is going to be doing an after COVID presentation. So they have these little webinars about an hour. They've been pretty, very productive, and uh, a lot of you have uh, said great things about them. So I'm glad you've enjoyed them. Uh, Surgical Room has also been a great supporter for us. I know they have a lot of great products, especially with PPE. They're trying to do their best to help our members. Um, and then as you know, through Hi Austin, we will still continue to have an advanced implant continue, surgical continuum when we're able to. So obviously some of these dates are gonna change, but this basically allows doctors to, under my mentorship, perform surgical cases in my office and we're allowing four in the morning, four in the afternoon. I know it's weird to talk about this stuff, but uh, it will happen eventually and we'll, I mean, I guess those of you who have registered already will have to keep in touch with Hi Austin, who's organizing this uh, um, for myself and my, the office. So, um, you know, there are always some questions from members. So I did want to go through those in particular. Um, uh, and as part of being an original study club, you know, we take pride in reviewing some of these cases and questions so everybody can benefit. So this was Dr. Chan. Um, I don't know if Peter is out there, but he had a question just in regards to seating a healing abutment. And he had seated, uh, and sometimes it's a little bit hard to tell, and we're going to talk about that today. But he had placed an implant, well-placed, I think it was guide, a guided surgery using the one guide. And um, as a result, um, he just asked, because he placed the uh, implant subcrestal, which is what we want, you know, what open tray or closed tray impression should we be using? And for me, my go-to really is a, a closed tray impression for something like that. Um, it's an R4. Oh. What's great about, oh, let me just uh, mute everybody, mute all. Sorry about that. Okay, and um, yeah, so basically an R4, which is the smallest size impression coping, it's easiest, even if you use a six millimeter wide healing abutment, it just allows you to seat it very easily. And then I use my light body and my PBS or putty to pick that up. So he asked, with a six millimeter wide healing abutment, can he seat an R6? Because the high Austin system comes with matching impression copings. And I said, you could, but the problem is if you have a whiner patient or it's pinching the tissue, then it becomes difficult really just to seat. So I always advise just using the smallest one and using the impression material. Sometimes we'll even use flowable to capture the soft tissue. So uh, that's just a question, not many questions obviously on implant surgery nowadays, but, uh, but still a question nonetheless. So moving on to over the shoulder surgery. So these are some cases that some doctors actually have come in and observe uh, myself doing. And that's really very impactful for doctors to be able to come in and actually watch a surgery 
you're not really coming to watch you know the steps although i mean many people are but really how how we manage or how i manage complications so this was a case with a 36 heavily heavily infected site actually had draining pus um, large swelling actually on the buckle even after two rounds of antibiotics so i'd seen this patient and uh, you can see there's a buckle fenestration here as well so as you know i'm the immediate guy the guru of immediates i call myself i don't know some of you can or may or may not agree, but uh, everything that I do in my practice is immediate implant. So um, we'll go ahead. I generally atraumatically remove the tooth. Okay, so we remove the tooth. We'll then go ahead and, um, you know, uh, debride the site. Oftentimes, I have, some of you have taken the immediate molar course and actually keep the roots in place. But in this case, I felt like there was a pretty good interceptal bone to use. Um, I go ahead and I prep using my drill to my um, anticipated depth. And then as, as my depth, uh, I take a drill uh, and take a PA with that to be able to basically assess my depth. And from that point, go ahead and debride the site. Now obviously here, there was a very, very large buckle defect. So by exposing the site and then adequately debriding it um, and then placing the implant in the optimal position, I can then go ahead and graft the site and once the site is grafted, go ahead and suture the site. And that's what's really important is to suture everything nicely. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. So the implant got placed immediately, we graft the site. And then this is the one week post-op, which I encourage you all to get, which is uh, generally uh, a nice photo. Okay, so we wanna make sure that uh, we take photos of our surgeries to be able to document you know, how things are going. And then ultimately, um, we have our three-week check. Um, and then we have our two-month post-op check. Okay, and things are looking really, really nice. And I haven't seen her since. So again, immediates, are they possible? Yes, these are more advanced cases. But with, um, you know, with adequate uh, technique and expertise, you can achieve an immediate almost in any case. And that's the uh, two-month post-op check. So that's just an over-the-shoulder surgery. It's the benefit of, again, being a member, coming in and watching chair side to surgeries. And that's something that a lot of doctors have benefited from. And in fact, many doctors have come and then done the procedure on their own patients. Um, so the goal for today really, um, and other than that, I'm actually just going to unmute everybody. Um, are there any questions or any concerns about that? No? Oh, I think you unmuted us. So if you guys can all actually mute yourselves, that would be great. But if you have a you can mute it. Okay, I think we might just do questions at the end because there's a lot of background. Okay, guys, so let's do that. Let's do questions at the end. I was a little bit different venue compared to what we're used to. But... Sorry, was there a question? It's not long. Oh, okay. Let's continue. I'm going to mute everybody again. Um, and actually, before I just proceed, can everybody um, uh, can everybody see the presentation? Okay. Can you just take that? Yes. You can see the presentation. Uh, okay, Azim. Good. Perfect. Okay. So let's just go through implant surgical complications, and that's the topic for today, basically. Ultimately, um, there are surgical complications, as we know. There's what I call, or what they call, what, what, you know, what uh, the implant uh, world calls early complications, and then there's late complications. And this lecture, you know, the purpose of today is not to go through every single one. We could be here all week reviewing all of these and going into depth with late complications in particular. Um, but I do want to touch base on the surgical um, complications as far as, um, you know, generally, um, you know, what in particular um, we can do to manage those surgical and early complications. So late complications, I'll touch base on very, very I mean, very briefly, but they occur during the process of osteointegration and thereafter. So generally, you're looking at things like implant failure, you're looking at periimplantitis, you're looking at lack of attached tissues. Um, uh, you're also, uh, you know, things like bone graft failure, um, you know, chronic sinusitis. So this is just an example of a case where you'll have periimplantitis. And this case was actually unique because it was an all-on case. And the patient only had four implants. 
which is why I said at my, one of my webinars, um, I said, I don't do, we don't do all on four if we can avoid it anyway. So this patient was in a rut. We took all that implant, he'd be screwed. He'd have only three implants and that prosthetic, um, those other implants would fail. So the plan for this patient actually with periimplantitis was to bribe the, to bribe the site, um, go ahead and graft as best we could. So you'll notice I grafted the, the one five implant, I guess you could call it, right? The angled implant and actually placed another implant anterior to that. And behind that area, I did a lateral sinus lift and bone graft in anticipation of really this patient having one implant in front and one implant in behind. So it's kind of like where, and then once that healed, you'll see here, I placed the most distal implant. So now what happens is this patient still has an all on four. This implant's still surviving. Okay, there's no pus, there's no exited. But again, these cases are more challenging and you got to come up with different game plans. Um, of course, lack of attached tissue is huge. Um, especially in cases, and this is actually my own case, this patient had a ridge, you know, some doctors say, oh, you know, you didn't shave down the bone enough. Well, this patient literally had a ridge that was this thin going all the way down. There's not much you can do in that case. Um, uh, no matter how much you take it down, the ridge is still thin. So for this patient, again, lack of attached tissues is really important uh, to understand, to assess uh, post-implant placement. Some people do it prior to, um, but I like doing post. And for this case, actually, the patient was complaining of pain on brushing. So we went ahead and did a bilateral, like I mean, a large free gingival graft. And then that's the soft tissue um, that uh, resulted. And ultimately, the patient now doesn't have that. But that's the best that we're going to be able to get, let's put it that way, um, as far as uh, moving forward for her. So these are like late complications. I know some of you asked, you know, when do we do free gingival? When do we not? I think we're going to touch base on that at the next meeting. But ultimately, we want to talk about surgical complications. So when you're actually doing the surgery, okay, when we're doing the surgery, um, what can go wrong, right? What really can we, what do we have to worry about? So we've got flap tearing, right? The flap can tear, okay? We can have an issue with the extraction. Um, the buccal plate can fracture, right? So um, we've got poor, a poor osteotomy position. We've also got bleeding concerns. And then, of course, we have bone perforation or dehiscence and then sinus perforation. So I think these are probably the most common issues that can happen surgically. And so ultimately, what we wanna do is we wanna avoid flap tearing, we wanna make sure that our incisions are clean, and you'll notice a difference between the picture on the left and that of the right, is that ultimately we've got one area that looks like a bit of a hot mess, and the other area where you can see everything's just nice and clean, you know when it's gonna go back together, it's gonna to look really good. So what are the causes of flap tearing, right? Number one, poor planning, right? And flap design has something to do with that. So many of us come into a situation and we just don't have a plan. Or we know what we're gonna do, but we really, really haven't thought it out. We haven't assessed the soft tissue. We haven't really done that. Um, improper instrumentation, you know? So you're using something that's huge, right? Like a molt nine in an area where the tissue is very thin or you're using that around corners, or what I call heavy-handed, right? You're just really just trying to rip everything off the site without any sense of finesse or flat management. And as a result, um, you know, and one here I didn't list actually is retraction. So when you actually retract, you retract the tissue too aggressively, again, you can induce this flap tear. So how do we prevent these things from happening, right? Like how do we prevent that from happening? So the ultimate goal is to assess the thickness, right? If you're working in an area that's very thin, then you know you need to be more gentle, right? Um, so you have to understand that, you know, not all areas you can use, um, you know, large instruments versus small instruments. You gotta assess the tissue. When you make an incision, we don't wanna use multiple 15 blade incisions, just keep, you know, piling in there and, and uh, creating uh, multiple cuts, you wind up having a very um, uh, uneven flap and that which is higher risk of tearing, okay? Um, also, we want to use small instruments when we're initially reflecting, and we want to use larger instruments for broader reflection, okay? So adequate reflection is very, very important. In fact, I stress, um, you know, to make sure most doctors are spending more time on this, in fact, than even the implant placement, to be honest with you. Okay, so adequate reflection retraction is important as well. Don't pull on the tissues, right? These retractors are meant to be pushed left on bone. So this is where 
the implant kit comes in having some good instruments like a molt two and a molt four or a spade or something very tiny to lift the corners um, and to work the small areas first or the fragile tissues first and then moving to broader base instruments i think is very important okay so how do we treat this if you have a flap tear you know what do you do first of all don't get it in the first place okay second of all if you don't have any grafting involved so there's no real bone grafting or huge grafting membranes then you can either just try to suture it if it reapproximates then and it's and it's reapproximated by the flap itself and it's sitting there properly then you don't need to do a whole lot some would use periacryl but again i hesitate with periacryl because again if it's a larger area then that periacryl can get inside the site and cause a foreign body reaction so be mindful kind of assess the thing and do you need to use it because remember a suture is to reapproximate. so if the flap is sitting there and it's got a bit of a tear and it's nothing overly you know concerning then again sometimes nothing is better i still like to suture and what i would use is a 5-0 or a 6-0 um, something like a monocryl but you need a small thread which means a small needle typically they're about the 13 um, millimeter needles or the smaller needles is really what we want to use for these areas, right? Because if you use something bigger, you're just going to tear the flap even more. Um, grafting itself, if you have grafting involved, then you need to assess where is this tear? Is it smack dab in the middle of your grafting? Is it right where the membrane ends? And you will have to suture that and stabilize it. And typically, these tears should be managed before you suture the entire flap back. So what you want to do is if there's tears in your flap, you want to suture those areas so that ultimately it looks like a nice clean flap again. And then you can worry about going ahead and, um, you know, moving to um, the, the main suture, I guess you could say, for the flap. Okay. So remember the 12 and a half steps. Dr. Shake, I call it 12 and a half steps. Super important. Okay, you need to make sure that you're very, very aware of these steps. You're taking these steps one by one. And I believe uh, the um, video, uh, and again, this was courtesy of Hashem um, uh, as group. Uh, the Dentistry Academy has posted this on the YouTube page, which is, um, will be there uh, for uh, the 12 and a half steps uh, webinar that I did. Okay, so uh, make sure that you're very well aware of that. And that is on the YouTube page for um, Dentistry Disrupted. Okay, and I can give you guys that link if we need to. Um, so extraction, what happens when you have an issue with extraction, right? That's a surgical complication, right? You don't know what to do. So how do you section, right? How are we removing the tooth, right? We want to make sure we do that as atraumatically as possible. So using good burrs, and I'm not talking about just a regular burr, I'm talking about long surgical length burrs, super small rounds or very fine diamonds, needle diamonds, can really help to trough around the tooth. Instrumentation is really important. So having something like a good luxating elevator, um, having good periotomes, um, and even apical forceps. I think I have a picture here. The, this is, a, you know, again, a periotome, which can get right into the PDL ligament and separate um, the tooth, uh, removing bone where the osteotomy is gonna be. So if you have an issue with an extraction and you're trying to place an implant or, you know, again, this is my life more, but uh, you know, I try to remove the bone where I think the osteotomy is gonna be anyways. And in this way, it'll help to remove the tooth itself, or the, I should say, the roots of the tooth, right? Oftentimes these um, molars, right? These endotreated molars. Luxating elevators are super important to have as well. Again, how do we use them is very important. They're, it's apical pressure and it's parallel to the tooth. So again, we're using it parallel, not using a perpendicular because again, your, your roots just going to keep cracking. And people spend hours and hours trying to take out roots of teeth when in essence that you just need to have a good plan and use burrs, use good burrs, long surgical length burrs and a good luxating elevator. And that's all you need really. Okay. Apical forceps really help as well. Um, again, cotton pliers are not, you don't get as much force, but using nice, fine apical forceps really helps as well. So what are the causes of having an issue with an extraction, right? Um, you know, of course, anatomy, um, ankylosis, hypercementosis, these things make teeth hard to remove. Look at anatomy. Look at this picture here. This is a case that I showed some of you, again, on the YouTube Dentistry Disrupted page. There is a two-hour webinar that I did on immediate implants, again, for Hisham and uh, the Dentistry Academy, which I'd all encourage you to visit. Um, but 
In this case, I did an immediate implant. Now, how the hell do you do that? Well, you'd have to watch that seminar. But more importantly, how to remove this lesion and how to remove this tooth. The crown of the tooth is larger than the root. So the path of withdrawal is something you have to consider. And actually for this case, I did a coronectomy only. i uh, sorry, um, I removed everything but the crown um, because I didn't want to get into the floor of the nose. Um, so causes of tooth anatomy, consider anatomy, root curvature, how many roots are there, right? Um, lack of CT, so we're not using our CT when it comes to removing teeth or removing teeth without CT um, can be more challenging, right? So when I have a CT, uh, it makes it easier. Um, not using proper instrumentation, so literally using a big, you know, regular elevator on an endotreated tooth, you know, or not sectioning the tooth, these things are going to cause fracture. You're going to have a harder time removing the tooth. And then again, being too aggressive overall, right? So here's an example um, uh, of a case where I was trying to do an immediate molar and I didn't assess the CT properly. And lo and behold, I'm trying to keep my septal bone, which you can see right here, and you'll see my drill, but guess what it's hitting? It's hitting the root, the mesial root, which often curves distally, right? Well, I did everything to try to take this root out. I couldn't get it out. Only way I could get this out was removing the septal bone. Well, guess what I needed to place the implant? The septal bone. So now the site is completely blown out. Blown out. How do you manage that? I'm gonna talk a bit about that as well when we get to lack of stability. So remember to assess the case and realize that these roots can curve and if they can go under and undermine, you can undermine bone and still have an issue. Now look at these two radiographs, right? We have molars, both of all of, you know, they're three rooted teeth, right? Upper molars, well, four rooted, but three roots. And you'll see why do we need a CT? And this is a classic case, and I show this in my immediate molar course, where you take a CT scanner, an axial slice of the CT, and you'll notice that we have three roots here, right? Three separate roots, okay? And as this case goes down, there's a large apical lesion. So this, we did an immediate molar as well with an, with an indirect sinus lift at the same time. Um, so there's what it looks like. And you'll see when we section the roots before I do my sinus lifting, um, okay, actually in preparation for the sinus lifting, um, this, is, this tells me I'm gonna section them in three. Now, if I look at this case for an immediate molar, right? Or just again, extracting the tooth, for those of you who don't feel comfortable. Um, when we go through the axial slicing, what do you notice here? You notice the distal buccal and palatal root are joined. So if I went ahead and I tried to section this tooth, and again, you'll see, welcome to my life, large apical lesions. We're doing immediates in all of these cases. Um, I have to section this almost like an L, right? I remove the mesobuccal root and I keep the distal buccal and the palatal there. So um, prevention, how do we prevent having a bad experience with an extraction. Well, of course, atraumatic extraction 101, keeping apical pressure, okay, when you're using instruments, removing bone where you've already planned an osteotomy, or in fact, in the molar situation, I actually will prepare my osteotomy in the middle of the roots, and that will remove interceptal bone, which then thereby allows me to extract the tooth easier, okay? So here's an example of that. You'll notice here that uh, you know, the, the, the drill itself is going right through the roots. And by doing that, and I like to keep it up to a 3.5 millimeter, that's where I stop. That allows that, that area where there's no bone and then it's easier to, again, um, elevate the tooth. Now, of course, you need to create enough space so that one root doesn't hit the other root, which is why, again, I like to remove the distal root first, if I, normally because of the root curvature on the mesial. So extraction, you've all been there where the roots, you know, everything starts cracking up and you're like, oh my God, where do I start? Um, but this is, a, again, a case showing that small little burr. If you look closely at this picture here on the premolar, um, but there's a trough all the way around. I will literally trough this tooth, staying inside the bone and maintaining the interproximal bone height as well. And remember, you're just literally trying to do a crown prep on the mesial, the distal, not touching the buckle, but the mesial and the distal, trying to do a crown prep on the root, okay? Um, but remember, even with your best efforts, by removing a tooth, you will find some bone can come out. How? Based on the anatomy, right? But based on the thickness of the bone, you may notice that the patient has just thin bone. Um, you'll see here, I'm trying to remove the bone, that little ledge, I'm trying to keep it, right? So again, removing it atraumatically with apical forceps is important. And again, sectioning the tooth is important. So the treatment, if you can't get the tooth out, 
Are you having problems? Make the osteotomy or drill more of the tooth out. Make the osteotomy larger. Drill more of the tooth out. Assess it. Use PAs. Okay, you can use the slob rule if you want as well. Um, some cases, you know, you get the tooth out, you can't place an implant graft only, or, you know, you have to refer it out. So again, don't worry about, you know, don't worry about not, I mean, at the end of the day, sometimes you just got to walk away, right? I mean, if you can't, if you feel like it's, you can't do it. Um, but again, a set, careful assessment of the tooth before is really important. Now, what else can happen during the surgery, during the implant surgery? And again, the extraction was initially, those cases would apply for those who are doing immediates, like an immediate anterior or a molar. Um, also locator cases, if you're extracting the teeth, and of course, all on cases as well. Um, so buckle plate fracture, I'm sure it's happened. Who's, who's that happened to? I can see a lot of hands here. I can't, but. Um, so buckle plate fracture can happen. So these are all some cases, these are all cases you'll see from mild, well, these are like mild, small little areas where you have buccal plate larger. This is an anterior zone on the left. Um, this is a canine area where, again, an immediate implant was placed. And then the lower right case is an actual huge, massive fracture right from the nasal spine right over to the premolar region. Um, and again, uh, that was, uh, I'll get to that. That was a fun case uh, of an all on case. So what are the causes? You have thin buccal plate. Okay, you've got an apical concavity. So you know there's a higher risk that that bone that's coronal might fracture. Um, you've got buccal lesions. You can see the CT here showing that there's a large buccal lesion. Again, that can cause that buccal plate to be undermined and thereby fracture. Um, if you're too aggressive with your extractions, you're not following the atraumatic extraction rules, or you have multiple osteotomies. So for example, in that case that I showed you with that large fracture, we removed all these teeth. So now what do you have? You have holes, right? Now, let's say we place our osteotomy site not in the, the site of the teeth, but palatal to that, because that's where our implant needs to go. So you have all these holes from where we've removed the teeth, and now you're creating more holes for your osteotomy. It undermines that buccal plate and the buccal plate fractures. Um, so that was a learning experience for myself. So here's an apical lesion, and actually this case, um, uh, the buccal plate was compromised as well. We had no buccal plate there, actually, so I had to regenerate that. So how do we prevent that? So an adequate pre-op assessment of the CT, look at this case. I mean, you can literally see the roots. It looks like there's no bone. So I'm preparing myself that the buccal plate ain't gonna be there. And as a result, my flap design would reflect that, okay? Atraumatic, supporting the buccal plate when we're removing teeth, atraumatic extraction, we talked about that. Having adequate visual field, because I feel like one of the most common reasons that doctors have implant failure are because of unknown apical perforations. They're not aware that there's a perforation, and there is, and they place the implant, and now there becomes soft tissue invagination into the site. So having adequate field of view, right? This is why flapless surgery I'm not a huge fan of, right? You wanna be able to see if there is a perforation, and of course, feeling that area, okay? And uh, as far as um, you know, larger cases go, like uh, you know, locator cases where we need to do ridge reduction, or for example, cases where we're doing it all on, I will, uh, I will intentionally induce what I call periodontal disease. I'll drill bone away around the tooth, especially canines, to make it easier. I'd rather compromise some bone and get the tooth out as opposed to trying to take the tooth out and lose the whole buckle plate. So there's kind of this balance. My magic number is about four to six millimeters. Okay, and oftentimes for those cases, we have to do that reduction to accommodate for the prosthetic and the prosthetic height, okay? So this is a case, again, you'll see on the right side, you can see the buccal plate on this tooth, okay? You can actually see the buccal plate. So this tells me, okay, I got a chance at maintaining the buccal plate. This is on the same patient, by the way, on the, so that was the one, two, this is the two, two, and again, if you see the immediate uh, anterior presentation, I go through this case in detail on how I managed it, there is no buccal plate. So actually, the one two, I didn't raise a flat. On the two two, we did raise a flat, right? And that's what will give you that idea. So how do we treat a buccal flat fracture? My advice is just to reapproximate the fracture. Okay, we do fractures all the time, ridge splits, intentional fractures. These are not bad things, but I would definitely reapproximate it. And we want to relieve the tension. So if you're placing an implant, you notice the buccal plate's fracturing or something like that then you want to relieve the tension. And with the tapered implant, as it gets placed more into the bone, that's where that tension is going to happen. So for some cases, I'll relieve the tension on the crest. 
And that's where, because that's where it's going to, that's where you're going to start noticing that buckle plate fracture. Okay, stabilizing the fracture. So whether we're just using the flap to stabilize the fracture and reapproximate things, or whether we actually have to incorporate bone grafting material, and in some cases, tacks or screws to stabilize it. Okay, and again, these are larger fractures. But if you lose the buckle plate, what do you do? Like the buckle plate is gone, right? So at this point, you're grafting only for most of you, okay? And then come back and fight another day, right? Reassess in the CT. And again, your GBR should include a membrane. Or in my case, if you live my life, I'm doing immediate implants because horizontal GBR I'm completely uh, okay with and it's very predictable in my hands. But again, it depends on your experience, okay? So this is a case exactly where you have no buckle plate, right? So again, I would advise, depending on your experience and your predictability in your hands, um, you just come back and graft this. In my case, I will go ahead and place the implant. I actually grafted the case and I need a temporary tooth for the patient. This is a five month post-op CBCT and uh, everything healed up very well for the patient. So again, these are things you guys have seen before. Um, so poor osteotomy position. And you'll notice obviously here, the implant is literally hitting the canine, okay? Um, this is a case, and again, this is an older case that I have where the implant was placed you know, not in the middle because look at this huge void. So I'm trying to grab some decent bone. But what happens when you do that? Your implant now is placed too close to the adjacent tooth. And when you make the crown, the patient can't clean that area. And what happens? Decay. Okay, it happens. It's inevitable. And really what should have happened was that implant should have been removed. This is one of my cases, right? I'm not here to hide anything. So what about a case like this where you'll see I'm placing two implants, multiple implants in particular are a bit more challenging, right? We all know that. So, um, you know, by moving the osteotomy, if you look really closely here, the initial osteotomy where the tooth was, because again, this was an immediate, um, was too close to the adjacent tooth. You know, that root was positioned too close, but it was not in the right spot for the implant. So I used a lindament or a side cut drill, and you'll notice how I moved it over. I moved the actual site distally. Okay, I don't know if you guys can see that. Hope you can. So, what are the causes? Poor planning, multiple implant sites. You'll see this is again one of my cases here. Okay, where, oops, sorry about that, where you can actually see um, one implant is slight, you know, it's angled, right? Could it be better? Absolutely. You know, so multiple implant sites are a bit challenging. Um, or if you're doing an immediate, the implant, you know, you're going to place your implant now just slips into a socket or the path of least resistance. And this is why immediates are more challenging. You need to get a good apical grab, right? For your implant to go on that area. Or sometimes it's the, hey, it'll be fine mentality, right? Like, like this case, you know, I looked at it, I was like, yeah, it's gonna be fine, but you know, it really isn't fine. You know, I would like to correct, should have corrected that really. And there's certain things you can make corrections at, there's certain times you can make corrections at in the surgery. Um, you know, the best stage is at the guide pin stage. Well, the time you enlarge it, Enlarge in the site, it's really tough to make that correction. Um, dense bone islands will throw you off, right? They will detect, they will, de you know, they'll, they'll deflect your drills. Um, or even the lingual plate, you know, for those doing guided surgery um, with something like a one guide where there's an open channel, you know, your implant might get deflected. Buckley, so you need to be aware of that. So, how do we prevent a poor position? Well, best way is guided surgery, right? Um, Another way for those of us free, for those freehand people like myself um, are taking guide pin and drills. You can see this PA was taken with some drills. What's nice about using drills is that it elongates the angulation. So you can actually get an over-exaggeration of, of really what that angle looks like, okay? If it's off, using a side cut. What's great about the high awesome kit, it comes with a side cut or a lindemann drill in it. And that's part of your final positioning. And, and I can't stress this enough, you're placing an anterior implant, especially for an immediate. Don't use the hand driver to put this, I'm uh, sorry, the, the, the regular torque wrench. Where's it gonna go? The implant's gonna move buckly, right? It's gonna shift into the path of least resistance. So this is where it's important. So here's a picture of a lindemann. Okay, so there's a lindemann, I'm moving the osteotomy. And again, this was a, uh, you guys might have seen, remember that case where there was a hole from the buccal tissue right through the bone to the lingual tissue. In this case, was immediately implanted and grafted and a tooth on it the same day. And I showed you guys a post-op CT as well. Uh, but I needed the liniment to really reposition it because the root itself was not in the right position. But the hand driver is what I was getting to. Um, the hand driver, it's basically like a Phillips screwdriver. 
you know, that attaches onto a fix, onto the fixture, you have your fixture driver, you take this, and now you can apply apical pressure the whole time as you're torquing the implant into your desired depth, as opposed to doing this. Um, and it keeps your implant in a really good position. Okay, so we talked about guided. Guided is really important, you know, uh, or it can help. I know a lot of those basic, uh, you know, doctors who are getting out of our, especially our basic implant training program, um, uh, you know, they go guided surgery because they like the fact that they can just put something on and all the positions are pre, pre, pre prepped. So this is a case that I did actually, I believe, no, we haven't posted the surgery on YouTube yet. Um, but, uh, I do have a video of it that I teach when I, when I lectured, actually I lectured at the Halton Peel last year on guided and this, uh, I believe I showed some of that video there. Um, but this one actually, uh, the guided surgery is quick. It's easy. Um, and it puts your implants in really nice spots. Um, especially when you're dealing with multiple implants um, or narrow spaces. So you can see this case actually has it all, right? It's got molar sites. Uh, so we are able to actually develop this one surgery, one step with some wide healing abutments. Um, and then, of course, a lower anterior case, which is a much more challenging. And um, again, you can do guided. So how do we treat a bad position, like a bad position, right? So go big, go wider, you know, remove the implant and replace it. Um, you know, uh, if it's not in the right position, right? So go longer, go wider. And most of these results uh, are a result of, as I mentioned, just, you know, not really taking, uh, you know, not really looking at your guide pen x-rays, okay? Um, in some cases, if you don't have the supply, because many of you may not have every single implant in every single size, like I do, um, then you don't have the stock, then you just have to walk away from that case, right? Uh, grafted only. Um, or, and then restore and inform the patient. So this is a case again, you know, where the implants placed a bit mesial and, you know, the labs can do some pretty crazy things. But as I mentioned, there's a higher risk of decay in those areas. Um, so you have to monitor those cases quite carefully. And I find, you know, removing the implant sooner than later and then, you know, replacing it if you can the same day or at a later date is the best option. So you have to really know when to walk away. Look at the big picture. And sometimes it's hard to do that, but you have to just know you have to focus on that and, and make sure you're doing a good job. So there was a question uh, that was asked on the group chat when, when we first started talking about this was, what do you, how do you get the proper position for locators? And for locators, remember, those implants have to be placed palatally because we don't want them coming in where the teeth, we don't want that locator coming out where the teeth come out because we're not going to have enough room. So remember, the implants are placed palatally, typically. And how do we line them up if we're not doing guided? Well, you can use, and this is from Alan Simeon Pieri, he actually will place a guide pin in the incisive foramen. And that will set him straight, that, the bar, and then he'll parallel everything else to that as he starts drilling his multiple implants. Using implants with, um, uh, what do you call it, those uh, mounts, okay, mounted implants, really help when you're doing multiple implants. In the high awesome implant, you can order mount, mounted or non-mounted. I was trained on non-mounted. So this is a case, again, with adequate reduction, good AP spread, good spacing of the implants uh, through some PRF membranes on top. Um, but again, I use the denture as a guide. So you remember to use the denture. The denture, we actually just created a few slits because the patient was still going to use this denture. And it gives me my 15 millimeter prosthetic height, how much reduction I need. Uh, really, I like to do a little hole in the premolar and then one in the, uh, on each side and then, and then also in the interior. Um, but you can also, and then of course the suturing, which we'll talk about, really, really important to make sure that you suture properly. So for many cases, um, if you don't do guided, you can still use surgical guides, right? So you can get a duplicate or a clear stent of your denture made, of your prosthetic made. Um, and then you can actually have a cutout and that'll give you the angulation. So this was an all on case. Uh, that I did. And what happened was because the anterior had resorbed, we needed multi-unit abutments to correct the angulation. And that angulation was corrected based on that guide, where those holes we needed to come out. So we chose in the anterior, we did 17s. And I think in the rest, we did straight multi-unit abutments. And then that's the case. We converted that. And then the patient left with that. So you can see good angulation, good spacing, good positions for the osteotomy is really what our goal is. And using whatever guides or x-rays that you can to do that will help to facilitate an ideal result. Um, so uh, what about lack of primary stability, right? I know we've all been there where, you know, we can't get the implant stable. So you'll see here's a case. And again, welcome to my life. Large infection. Patient was referred to me. He had seen a couple specialists and wanted an implant the same day. 
and um, the site is blown out, the nerve is here, huge lingual concavity, where are we gonna engage an implant? And the patient actually was on a timeline, of course, as all patients are, right? Um, so by the time you remove a tooth like that, the site, it's conical, it's blown out. I mean, there's nowhere to place an implant, right? Right? Wrong, <laughs> okay? This is the case on the right side where the site was completely blown out. And I did place an implant with bone. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And there's the final restore case. Uh, a little bit about how crazy you can really get depending on how big you are. So causes, what are the causes of lack of stability? And guys, if you do have um, questions, then I think what we're gonna do is we will, I will go through the group chat and uh, I will, you know, I will review those questions. Sorry guys, yeah, the questions. Um, so you can feel free to kind of type in some questions there as well if you have, okay? Um, but my advice would be kind of write down your questions and then save them for the end and then we can kind of go through them uh, in the chat and, I'll, and we'll unmute people as well. So the causes, if you prepare the osteotomy too large. So as I mentioned, when you're preparing an osteotomy, especially when you're a beginner, it's, it's like a marriage, right? You're sitting in that site too long when it really needs to be like a one night stand. You need to be in and you need to be out. Otherwise, your three and a half size hole becomes a four millimeter hole really quick, okay? So it's important not to stay in that site too long. Inadequate depth. Okay, so if you over prepare, that's a problem because that will lead to your implant being loose or not stable. Inadequate depth. So you're trying to place your implant, okay? But now you're just over torquing it, okay? Or you just keep torquing it in, but the implant's not going to cut apically, especially in the lower, right? In the upper, you might have some soft bone. You might be able to push things up. So it's important to not over torque, uh, sorry, to prep your depth properly. And this commonly happens with guided surgery because your guide is not seated and then you're gun shy and it won't go right down. It's over torquing the implant. So you're just torquing and torquing and all of a sudden it just gets loose, okay? Because you're trying to push it in more when you haven't prepped the depth properly. What if there's debris in the osteotomy? So cortical bone, and now all of a sudden there's debris in the osteotomy. And again, that's impeding your implant from being placed. If you have soft bone, right? Really soft bone. And again, you don't follow proper protocol. Or if you have hard bone and you haven't actually over prepped the bone, because in some cases of hard bone, we actually prep the site a half a millimeter larger than the intended size of the implant to be able to actually get it down. Um, inadequate bone volume, there's not enough bone to support the implant, okay? Or you've completely blown up the site. And then of course your implant design is super important because it needs to have somewhat of an aggressive thread, an active thread. Again, not too aggressive where it's chewing up bone, but aggressive enough to grab the bone. So again, as we know, there's different types of quality and quantity of bone. And you know, there's, um, you know, how to prevent this from happening is you have to assess the CT. Now, of course there's Hounsfield units and all these things, but at the end of the day, they're not accurate. What I like to do is look at the CT cross section and I look at the cortical bone, and then I compare the cortical to what's inside, the trabecular bone, uh, the cancellous bone. And if there's a huge variation, that tells me that, you know what, if I don't engage my implant in the crest, and I try to go too far subgingival, my implant's gonna be floating around. So you have to assess, this is a case here where you can see some grafting was done, but it's pretty soft on the inside, right? Okay, so drilling, minimal contact and rotation, be careful because mandibular molar sites with this much bone and this much bone, you can get a spinner. So you have to evaluate the bone quality. And in essence, if you're unsure, under prep, right? Um, copious saline irrigation, so there's no debris. Um, if you feel like you have lost stability, then you can go, if there's cortical bone, um, you know, then engage the cortical bone, right? Cortical bone meaning floor of the nose, floor of the sinus, and if you have the proper length which is why I use a lot of long implants. I try to get that cortical bone. Um, and of course you need to have adequate inventory because if you need to go wider or longer, then you need to have that adequate inventory. So um, you'll see the comparison of this type of bone where it's more radiolucent on the inside, which tells us it's softer compared to this, which is lower anterior mandible. That type of bone I have to prepare. If I'm placing here a four millimeter implant wide, I prep it to a four and a half to be able to get it down. That's what you have to do. So to treat um, a case where you don't have stability, please confirm your size and depth, okay? Because oftentimes it's the depth, it's not deep enough, um, or you prepped it too big, okay? If you can use a wider, longer implant if possible, 
And this is where having a good safety zone when you're planting your implants comes into play. Engage cortical bone. So engage the floor of the nose, floor of the sinus, okay? Um, or I'll even talk about the lingual plate, but that's again, more advanced. Um, or if you're doing an immediate, try, if you can't engage apically, try to engage the width of the socket, okay? And I'll show you a picture of that. Um, but you might have to walk away. You might have to graft it, or you can place the implant with a cover screw, okay? So by placing the implant, with the cover screw, you're gonna say, well, if there's no stability on that implant, you know, how do we do that, right? So the answer to that is, let's see an example. Here's an example, completely blown out size. This is an upper molar, and again, I had this case on my immediate molar, uh, immediate um, implant presentation. Um, first of all, it was a very long site, okay? So I needed actually, uh, to engage the floor of the sinus, I needed an 18 millimeter implant, and I had one. Okay, so once I engaged the implant, I wanted to make sure that my implant was placed about four, up to five or six even millimeters, uh, you know, from the CJ of the adjacent tooth. And here it was about five millimeters. And so I placed the implant, engaged that, and then I grafted the whole thing. I'm not going to take you through the whole case, um, but that's what it looked like afterwards. Okay, and we had a nice uh, healing. This was a one step, one surgery. This is five months post op. Um, what about a case like this? The entire palatal wall, this is an upper premolar, the entire palatal wall is gone. And so here, in a case like this, where am I going to engage my implant, right? So I'm first going to widen out and engage the sinus floor, and I use that using my cast drill, which is the cast kit, the sinus, indirect sinus kit. It has non-end cutting drills. So I engage that area, but I also want to engage the width. Okay, I wanna engage the width. So I measure what that width is, and I choose an implant that's about a half a millimeter wider. Okay, so I might do a little bit of a light prep, and again, this is where implants get fun. It's bone manipulation is what you're doing. And then, of course, I grafted the site. Uh, there's the implant. Okay, a little bit, uh, and then, uh, yeah, so there's the implant, and the final crown restored. Um, and again, this case is listed. Uh, cortical bone, so if you have the anterior wall of the sinus, and you have the floor of the nose, why can you see those? It's cortical bone. So I'll take a drill and I will push even harder, right? And I'll place my implant so it engages into that cortical bone. And for cases like this, imagine an all-on case, patients are spending 50 grand to walk out with teeth the same day. If you can't get primary stability, you shouldn't be doing implants in an all-on four case. You shouldn't be telling patients you can guarantee that. You should feel very comfortable using cortical bone so you can get that primary stability almost every single time. And I know Paulo Malo, uh, the big guru of Alon, actually will fire his oral surgeons, perios, if they don't engage the cortical bone on every single implant. Okay? So this is, again, just another case. And you'll notice on the upper that every implant is touching that line or that cortical bone, again, to get that stability and that anchorage, and you will get like 100 Newton torque. So the implant will go in, no torque, nor torque, and beep, all of a sudden it torques right out. Okay, and this is again another case where again we did, uh, I told you I'm not a big fan of all on four, so I will do lateral sinus lifting, <coughs> and you'll notice again we're, we're engaging the cortical floor. So in a case where you have, um, you know, zero stability, and the site is completely blown out, um, and depends again on your comfort, but in this case the patient was sedated, she made it very clear to me, do whatever you need to do to get the implant in. I'm okay if it fails. So your consents and your patient management and expectations are very important. But in this case, I placed sticky bone, which is PRF, sticky bone, on the distal. Then I took my cotton pliers, sterile, picked up the top part of the, the implant um, and with a cover screw on it, and I placed it in the site, packed some sticky bone on the mesial, okay? And then ultimately, I then use my hand driver to reposition the implant. Okay, so it's a little bit crazy. Sutured it, did a two stage, and then after five months, uh, sorry, after six months, we did the stage two, and then there's the final implant with the crown. So again, um, primary stability is not an uh, absolute must, but my advice would be to get it. If you can't, you're taking a risk. I feel very comfortable because I've done multiple cases like this before. Okay, so um, this is a case that I showed you, again, that same case whereby the patient had a huge hole. So for this case, I engaged lingual cortex. And again, I did that very carefully, okay? I did that with a cast drill, which is a non-end cutting drill. And the way you do this, not that I'm advising you to do this, but again, this is more advanced, is a cast drill. And instead of going in, out, in, out, like we normally do, 
The risk is if you go in, out, in, you just perforate. Okay, you want to use a rocking motion so that your drill tip is constantly contacting that lingual plate. So you can actually feel a bit of give and then you stop. Okay, so again, a more advanced technique. This is the patient's uh, final crown um, and everything I SQ'd at over 75. So, okay, so we talked about primary stability. I hope I was able to, because I know that's a big one. I'm um, bleeding. You know, where, what about bleeding? We get so much bleeding during the surgery. Like, how do we manage that, right? So we know the upper uh, arch of the greater palatine. We also have the lower area with the lingual artery um, or the sublingual artery. How do we manage these? The key is not to get in there, but the causes are typically the patient's medical. Okay, so the patient's on blood thinners. Um, the anatomy, which I just went through. When there's severe periodontal disease, you will get a crap load of bleeding. Until you remove all that diseased tissue, the bleeding is going to continue. Okay? Accessory vascular channels are possible. And in many cases, we don't see them. And that's why the importance of oftentimes a CT can pick that up. Poor surgical manipulation. So we just really have not, um, uh, you know, uh, been kind to the tissues. Or we've done basically these periosteal releases where I see like nine or ten cuts. You just keep cutting and cutting and cutting. So nothing is... There's no thought into what you're doing. And as a result, you just get bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. Um, or an inadequate flap. If you have a partially reflected flap and there's still tissue tags all over, you'll still get a lot of bleeding from that area. So keeping things clean is really important. So here's an example. Actually, I just worked on this patient before COVID, um, about a month before COVID. And I opened up the upper arch and this guy, honestly, I don't know how the hell this thing just kept bleeding. And lo and behold, prominent vascular channels. Thankfully, I had the CT and I was able to manage it. And I'll talk about that in a second. But they can be there and they can be extensive and it can cause a lot of bleeding, okay? Especially even lower arch, lower lingual area. And this is why it's important to lift, especially if you're doing full arch stuff, you need to be very comfortable with your anatomy in these areas. But lifting nice, clean flaps is really important. So how do we prevent this from happening? Well, you want to take a good medical, right? Have a good medical... Um, you may need the patient. I'll oftentimes send a letter to the doctor if I need to, if we want them to be on a drug holiday or if they can be on a drug holiday. Of course, avoid anatomical structure, right? So don't get into those areas in the first place. Um, manage your flap. So again, be gentle, nice, clean flap. And again, even when we're doing a periosteal release, as I mentioned during my 12 and a half steps, we will put some compression on the area to stop the bleeding, to ensure that, again, that doesn't compromise what we're going to do later on, which is add the implant and, and the bone. I'm getting really good primary closure. Okay, so this is why if I do an immediate, I'm always using healing above it to get really nice primary closure. Good suturing, right? So tight knots, not tight sutures. And then compressing the site and removing any of that, um, you know, allowing that fibrin clot to form so that there's not bleeding. Um, using a fixed prosthetic, that, that like an all-on situation, you basically get a prosthetic that basically acts like a Band-Aid. For locator cases, we're using an upper denture. But again, if the denture is not stable, it's just going to cause things to bleed. So in those cases, we may just use gauze only. Okay? And then again, good post-op instructions, right? So um, again, you'll see from this picture, this is just I harvested a connective tissue graft. And you know, some will say it's overkill, but I will suture with compression sutures. I will add periacryl and I'll also use a surgical stent because I don't want to get the call, right? So just do whatever you can. Okay, so if there's a lot of bleeding, work fast or as fast as you can. Okay, compress the site, right? So you want to try compression and just oftentimes just compression will be enough to stop the bleeding. Um, good suturing, periacryl can be used as well. Oro Aid is another product that you can buy that helps kind of stop bleeding. Um, using a surgical stent or using the denture. I'm definitely telling the patient no function on the site. Um, if you have a fixed temporary prosthetic, that definitely, if you can go to a something fixed, that will just sit on the site and stop the bleeding. And then electrocautery if you have it in your office. Okay, so that's kind of how we manage bleeding. Um, and uh, so bone perforation, another surgical complication, right? So you actually have a fenestration. So not a full buckle plate fracturing, but just a fenestration. I think I touched base on this. Um, a bit earlier, but you know, you can see some nice bone perforations here, fenestrations. Um, same thing here, as I mentioned, you know, you take out that premolar, and if you don't flap that, you don't see the perforation. But when you when you do flap it, you see there's a pretty decent apical perforation there. So it's really important to understand that, especially when we're placing implants the same day. 
And as a result, that would allow us to go ahead and graph that area really nicely, right? Because we actually have good view of the site. So causes of, oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. So causes of buccal fenestration, um, really, we've got, um, you know, thin buccal bone, we've got the buccal concavity. Um, what if you have a lesion, right? So if you have a lesion in the area, again, you may have that apical concavity or fenestration. Um, there's not enough bone, or you're using a drill and it's too low. The RPM is too low and the bone just starts bouncing around and it perforates, okay? So there's an example of a case, again, where we did an immediate anterior. You can see clearly a huge apical uh, dehiscence due to apical concavity, I guess you could say. Um, but again, the implant was placed. So how do we prevent this, right? Being, a, having a, a proper assessment of the CT, looking at the bone, looking at the site. So we know if there's going to be, um, you know, a, 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 an apical perforation, we can see it, we can graft it. Okay. Feel your osteotomy after every drill, feel your osteotomy and check to see if you have a perforation after every drill. I'm using expansion tools like the Densa burrs, which expand, or even ridge expansion, which you can see on the right side, kind of helps to minimize the risk of having an apical perforation. Again, these are more advanced techniques. Now, if you can't place an implant, do horizontal grafting, but how predictable is that in your hands, right? How predictable is that in your hands? And then, of course, stable drilling. In some cases, I will actually increase my RPM. So if it's drilling faster, there's less risk of things kind of bouncing around. Okay, so how do we treat it? Well, you need to reflect it, you gotta expose it, and then you have to graft it, right? Whether you're doing it with the implant the same day, which is what I typically advise um, and recommend, um, if you feel comfortable to do so, or you just do grafting only, okay? So this is the same case with that anterior that I showed back there that ultimately led to, um, you know, a large um, apical, um, air, apical concavity, and then we just winded up grafting the entire thing. So I think that's, uh, that's important to understand. Um, and then we have, uh, this is the post-op. Again, you can see nicely grafted, good soft tissue volume. But the last option is just pretend it didn't happen. Okay, because I'll tell you, a lot of people don't know what happened. And then they wonder why their implant failed. So you can pretend, but guess what? It may bite you in the ass later on. Okay, so be very wary of that. Sinus perforation can happen also when we're placing an implant. So you can see here's a minor sinus perforation while I was doing an immediate. This is a larger sinus perforation from a failed implant. Okay, and that again, it was a very long case, which I won't get into. So what are the causes? Well, there's not enough bone, you start drilling and you perforate, okay? So, um, or you're using drills like a Densa, which I've perforated with, or the cast drill, which I've rarely perforated with, and you're just spending too much time in the osteotomy, and now it's just too much contact with the membrane. <laughs> Okay, you're aggressive in your instrumentation. So if you're doing lateral sinus lifting, again, you're too aggressive. Or the patient just has a really thin membrane, okay? Or you've extracted the teeth and now there's a big perforation. And that's happened. You'll see this case on the lower right. Uh, this was an all-on case. And the patient actually had, I could tell from the CT that the roots were in intimate contact with the sinus. And by the time I removed them, there was a monstrosity of a hole. Monst huge to the point where I actually had to do a direct lift through the crest. And you guys have seen me do that a couple of times. So once that tear and everything, there was a tear also in there. Once I was all repaired, I was then able to actually place an implant, pretty much almost like a zygomatic implant where just the apex of the implant was engaged in cortical bone. And we loaded this case as well. Okay, so, um, sorry about that. So prevention, prevention is the key, right? So adequately assess the CT. Okay, use the casket. You can see here on the video on the right side, I've actually kept the teeth in place because I didn't want to remove the teeth because if I removed the teeth, there would have been a higher risk of what? Perforation, right? So I kept the roots in place and I did the sinus lift through that. You can take PAs to confirm where you're at as well. Um, a Valsalva confirmation, again, just getting the patient to breathe in and out through their nose and we'll do that with the casket. Or you just avoid the sinus entirely right just use a shorter wider implant if you can um, if you feel comfortable doing lateral you can go lateral because you have better access and visibility or if you have a piezo you can use a piezo right the cube is what i have and um, again i'll use that for laterals if i need to um, so how do we treat it is it a minor perforation is it a major perforation 
Okay, that's what you got to figure out. Is it minor or is it major? And if it's minor, you know, something about two millimeters or less. And, and again, with the numbers here, if greater than six millimeters refer to the amount of residual bone you have. So if the perforation is small, I would say about a millimeter to two millimeters. Anything over two millimeters, I would consider a bit moderate. And then again, larger than that major. You need to figure out how big it is and what you can do to repair it. So my advice is pretty simple. If you have a residual bone of six millimeters or more, and you have a seven millimeter implant, I would put a little bit of PRF or collagen foam, and then I would place the implant. And I would try to go wider as opposed to going longer, okay? Um, if, um, if we have less than six millimeters of bone, then you can close the site up if you can't go lateral, okay? So if you can go lateral, then go ahead, do a lateral approach, then you'll you know you know open up the site, repair the the, the lateral, uh, you know the lateral, and then go ahead and continue on. Um, but uh, if you don't feel comfortable with that, then I would just walk away, close the site. Okay. So again, it depends on how much residual bone you have and what implant size you have as well. Okay. So this is again a lateral site. You can see there's a small perforation. It turned into a large perforation. At which point in time we've got immediate implants in there. There's a huge perforation in the site. So this is a more of an advanced technique. We're actually drill a couple holes, so two holes on each side. Um, oh, sorry, I think we have, uh, let me just mute everybody here. I think we still got somebody. Okay, so yeah, so we've gone ahead and we've um, created two holes. So if you can see that, we've got two holes on each side of the window, and then we're taking a, a, a suturing the membrane to those holes, and I can tell you it's not easy to do that. This is a 30 by 40 membrane, so it's huge. It actually invaginates into the membrane, creating a new floor. And then what happens is I'll go ahead and I'll graft the bone and then I'll close that site back up. Okay, and you can see that's the post-op suture case. We haven't seen this patient since. Uh, this case was done about three months ago. So again, if you feel comfortable, but remember, do not place bone into the area. Sorry, I got to blow my nose here. Okay, don't place bone if you have a perforation. Not a good idea. Okay, definitely a big no-no. Okay, so... Um, so I hope that covered sinus perforations if that does happen. Now there's, so we talked about surgical complications. So the ones like during surgery that can happen, right? And I hope I covered uh, a lot of those. I'm sure I've missed some points, um, but I tried to do my best. Um, now we're talking about early complications. So those that occur immediately post-operatively, okay? And they can interfere with the healing. So we've got swelling, right? Which we've all come across bruising, paresthesia, right? So nerve issues or nerve damage. Um, hematomas, okay, or bleeding concerns, right, post-op, um, infection, or we have flap opening. So what do we do when their flap is open and the bone is exposed, right? Like, and what do we do in that case? So that's what we're going to talk about here. And sinusitis. So the patient's now complaining of some sinus-related issues. So with sinusitis, it's inflammation, right, on the lining of the sinus. And there's air. The sinuses are filled with air. When they become blocked, Again, you can, you can get an infection. So the causes typically are if you've gone ahead and you've treated a patient who already has sinusitis, okay? That's a problem, shouldn't do that, right? We should get our patients cleared and, and that attended to before we do surgery. Um, if there's bacterial contamination, so for example, you know, there's graft or there, the graft got contaminate, contaminated or the implant, or there's an adjacent tooth with an apical lesion. And now you've gone and opened up that site inadvertently by working on the tooth beside it or the missing tooth beside it. And now all of a sudden that causes a disturbance in the sinus, that apical lesion it affects the adjacent tooth. I've seen that happen. Or if there's an outright sinus perforation, and now you start shoving bone in there. Okay. Wound dehiscence, the wound opens up in the area of the sinus and that can cause an infection because the oral bacteria gets into that area. Or you just place an implant into the sinus and there's pathology. So there's a, a mucus retention cyst or something like that. And now that mucus retention cyst has popped open and now there's an, you know, there's an infection that arises and causes implant failure. So um, there's acute cases, right, where the patient will complain of pain. Um, there might be swelling or edema in that area. Generally, the tissues will be reddened. Um, but those chronic cases where the membrane starts thickening and there's actually a decreased air in the sinus due to opac opacification. And that opacification can then cause um, blockage of the ostium. And so those are more chronic cases. Again, I don't want to get too much into that. 
Um, but I do want to talk about how do we prevent a sinusitis happening. And I think it's important to assess the CT, review any pathology, and then send them to uh, a, a, you know, a doctor who may refer them and then to an ENT. If you're treatment planning, try to minimize the risk of sinus perforation, of course, right? So try not to get one or try not to get involved in that area. If you can avoid or you don't have adequate tools to do that, like a cast kit. Um, using minimally invasive techniques, right? So the casket, um, short implants, and then managing the perforation. So if there is a perforation, manage it. Um, again, not being aware of it can lead to bigger problems, i.e. sinusitis. So if the patient does present with some sinusitis or issues post-op, then what I like to do is prescribe them some antibiotics, and that would be a combination. It used to be called Augmentin. They don't have that anymore. But amoxicillin and clavulanic. Um, it works really well, and if they're allergic, then you can use Clinda. Um, having the patient use some rinses or even nasal decongestants, again, depending on what you feel is happening, if there's granules coming out of the patient's nose, you know that the bone graft is gone through a perforation, then you may really want them to flush that out before it blocks the ostium, okay, that you can use a neti pot for. Um, and then manage the pain, because they probably will have pain associated with the sinusitis. So, okay, so again, hopefully that doesn't happen. If, you, if you're careful and you select your cases carefully, then that shouldn't happen. Um, swelling, you know, I oftentimes get doctors say, oh my God, you know, it's patients complaining of swelling. What do I tell them? And you can see on, the, on a small scale, you know, something localized to a larger scale where we're doing like a full mouth reconstruction, patients will call with, with these concerns. And it caused from accumulation of fluid, it's also patient variability. Some patients have more swelling than others. And it's normally oftentimes related to the extent of the surgery, meaning the duration of the surgery, but also the extent of the surgical trauma that we're gonna induce, so how big are our flaps. Um, and again, to me, I'm, I'm okay. I'd rather have more visibility when I'm doing the surgery, and the patient would agree with me that they'd rather have you see more and have a bit more swelling and get a better outcome than you not see as much have less swelling, but now have a problem, okay? So I will reiterate that it's good to have good surgical field. Um, but preventing you know, issues with swelling, well, you can minimize your surgical time, so try to be as efficient. You know, I've seen some doctors, the site's open, and now they're talking about ortho, and oh yeah, how's your day? Like, dude, just get the damn surgery done, man, okay, or woman. All right, minimize the trauma to the site. So don't pull on things, don't keep cutting things. These are just not good things. If you're doing that to your arm, and you know, and what you're doing in the patient's mouth, you start doing to your arm, and it just your arm won't look good afterwards, then that probably means the patient's not gonna heal very well or have a lot of swelling. Okay, and then compress the site. That is my 12th and a half step, or my 12th step of surgery, right? Is compress the site, remove any blood pooling. Because again, if it pools, that increases bruising and swelling. So the treatment oftentimes for swelling is, you know, corticosteroid usage I don't use, but many doctors do. Um, making sure the patient uses ice immediately post-op for the first 24 to 48 hours, sorry, correct that after, and then heat after. And reassure your patients and your staff that everything will be fine, it will heal, okay? And of course, get the patient to limit their movement. So again, less risk of things opening up. So ultimately, you just don't really want to, um, you know, get too freaked out. And if you're just getting into surgery initially, you know, it's, you have to remind your staff that, listen, our patients will have swelling. So be, be, you know, you know, make sure that they're aware to tell them this is normal. It will resolve. We give our patients a cold pack and that often helps to minimize um, the swelling and they appreciate that, but managing it very well is important. Now, what do you do with patients who bruise? You know, I've done full arch cases where the patient has no bruising, and I've done, you know, or, and I've, then I've done a single immediate molar and the patient has all bruised, you know, is bruised up completely. And remember that bruising oftentimes will come down by gravity. So it might start off on their face and they now end up in their, uh, in their neck or even in their upper chest area. So this is, again, the causes are typically longer complex procedures. The patient has a history of blood thinners, older age. And again, they're not compliant. Sometimes that can also cause bruising. They start touching the area, it starts bleeding again, and then it pools inside the site. So um, prevention is a good medical history. Okay, we wanna manage their medications. We wanna decrease the surgical time. And then of course, as I mentioned, compressing the site. Try to get primary closure of your sites. Okay, I would strongly encourage you to do that. And with immediate, immediate how we do that is with an immediate temporary crown or a healing abutment.
Okay, don't I boys use it cover screws if I can, unless it's a locator case. Um, and then hemostatic agents are out there as well. But manage your the treatment is just manage your patient expectation, right? Let them know right from the beginning that there's going you may have swelling. Give them the worst case scenario, and then prepare them for post op instructions. You know, scare them. Okay, and also reassure not only the patient but also your staff that everything is going to be okay. Oftentimes, swelling resolves, and if it's not resolved, then you would want to see the patient back to assess the site and again, possibly give them additional antibiotics, okay? Um, hematoma and bleeding, again, can occur right after the surgery, and how do you manage that, right? So it's important to um, understand the causes, the medical, um, oftentimes the flap, if your flap is not stable, then the site, if it's moved, can start bleeding. So what may, you may think is clotted, may actually start bleeding again, especially when the patient starts walking, that heart rate increases and it can start causing bleeding again after they leave your office, okay? So tearing of the tissue, um, functioning on the post-surgical site, okay? So if they start chewing on it or they start moving it around, uh, if the flap completely opens up, again, you can get bleeding, right? And then of course, my favorite, which has happened to me last year, on a patient who was on blood thinners, we did a full upper arch on locators, I think it was six locators, and then we closed the site, the patient decided to use glue post-surgery, and he thought he was putting it in the middle of the denture, and he put it on the left, his upper left, and he ended up in the hospital, lost I think like five pints of blood because the site opened up when he removed the denture, and it ripped open the sutures, and we lost two implants, so not good, okay? So how do we prevent it? Primary closure, suture, and compression. You can use PRF, it also helps to initiate the fibrin clot or collagen, and again, you want to manage the flap, right? If you have a nice, clean flap and you're atraumatic and you put it back, then it'll heal properly. Less chance of having this issue. Um, okay, if you can do, have a fixed prosthetic go on top, that's the best. That's the best Band-Aid. Um, but make sure that you have some compression. So I know Andrew's on here from Smile Care Denture. He does a fantastic job with our conversions. And he makes sure that we have some nice compression on the site, which minimizes the risk of bleeding. Okay, you can use the denture if it's stable. But if it's not stable... Tell them to keep the denture out, otherwise you'll have a higher risk of bleeding. Or just using gauze. And quite frankly, scare your patient, okay? Do a good job with the post-op instructions so that they know that there could be bleeding, you know, and this issue can make things worse. So they need to be extremely careful and cautious for not pulling on things or taking out the surgical stent if they have one or whatever, okay? You need to make sure they're serious about it. So the treatment, if there is bleeding, bring them back in the office. Or you can tell them over the phone to bite down on some gauze or bite down on the denture and stay closed. Don't talk, right? You can, if you need to see them in the office and there's really a big problem, you could add additional suturing, but I oftentimes normally find with compression, it's enough. Remind the patient, no movement, and then also encourage them. And this is oral aid. This is that product I was telling you that you can, you know, maybe put as a second layer if you need to um, on top of a harvest site. Um, some will do that for a palatal harvest, but make sure that they're sleeping with their head elevated. Okay. So remember there's that difference in blood pressure initially when they go from standing to laying down and by keeping their head elevated, I find I really have had no issues with bleeding. Okay. If you get a hematoma and it's large, depending on the patient's medical, you may have to go in there and just remove it and then re-suture the site and compress it. But again, what's to say that hematoma might not form again. So oftentimes time will resolve it on its own, okay? Infection, now what do we do when we have an infection? And um, we see the patient back, there's pain, and now there's an infection. So this is a case um, on the right side. Sorry, I'm just going to go ahead and... Okay, don't talk, daddy's on the phone. Everybody again? Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. So this is a case on the right side, so I'm going to go back, where the patient, we did an immediate anterior, the patient was ready to restore, and my referring dentist sent this back to me and said, there's a bubble now. <laughs> I said, oh, crap. So what happened here? Well, the graft didn't take. So I had to open this up, and then I regrafted on top of this area, um, and that's the post-op. So far, so good. So again, infection can occur at multiple stages, even post-operatively, because we never saw this infection actually during the healing phase, and the patient had an immediate temporary crown. Um, so again, the bone clearly did not take uh, in this case. So 
Um, and then there's the regrafted site and everything's healing up so far. So what are the causes? Well, typically these will happen, this infection will happen during the first several days or weeks of the surgery. You get bacterial contamination, normally because of the flap opening. And, um, or it could be also because there was bacteria in the site, whether it was directly, uh, you know, when you were doing the surgery or indirectly as a result of the flap opening again. So how do we prevent it? Well, we want to optimize our patient for healing. We want to set them up in a way where they're optimized. Like a patient going into the hospital, we want to make sure that their vitamin D levels are good, their, crust, their, their cholesterol is good, you know, that they're not immunodeficient or immunocompromised, okay? Adequate release and suturing to make sure that when we do close our flap, it's going to stay there. And again, that's super important. A sterile working area and technique, okay, to make sure that we have separate instruments for biomaterials. We're not using the same instrument in the patient's mouth and then going and mixing bone with it. We're keeping our implant and bone sterile. And then some will use a pre-procedural rinse, okay, or they'll have the patient start using a rinse maybe a day or two before. So this is a case, again, where, um, you know, the ridge is very thin here. So you'll notice the immediate implants or the implants go in, but there's a large area of bone um, deficiency in this case. So this is a large graft, and I'm using um, Dr. Urban's technique of a sausage technique where we're using master pins to secure that. But now there's a high risk of infection here because the site is, I've added so much volume. So if I don't release the tissue enough and then use proper suturing, and in this case, I like to use horizontal mattresses initially, and then simple interrupted matches, there's a high risk that this site can just open up. So again, being very mindful of how to ensure that we're gonna suture things and get closures, because that will greatly help to reduce the risk of infection post-operatively. And of course, this case now is ready for a free gingival graft, which we have yet to do. Um, so how do we treat a case where there's infection, right? Where you get infection shortly thereafter. You know, antibiotic therapy can help, Chlorhexidine rinsing can also help um, going in there and debriding the site, but that means you might lose some bone around that area. Some doctors would reopen and assess, but what are you going to do differently now? That's the question you have to ask yourself. What are you going to do differently? What did you do the first time or what happened? And now what are you going to do differently to ensure that we get a good outcome? Okay, so whenever you think about going back in and reassessing or opening up the surgical site, you need to figure out what are you going to do differently to ensure a better outcome, okay? So now we have our temporary crown or our healing abutment that loosens, right? Patient calls you, oh, I got something in my hand. And I've already had two patients call me during this COVID mess. One has a temporary crown in their hand and another one has a healing abutment in her hand. So oftentimes this will happen. Um, you'll see here, here's a healing abutment not fully seated. And you have to know your system to know what it looks like because it's a little bit harder to see on the platform switch implants, but you'll see here um, one implant is seated, the healing above it, the other one isn't. Um, uh, when we're doing immediate crowns, it's especially in lower anterior areas or laterals where it's really tight, it's really hard to seat those um, temporary abutments um, for the temporary crown. So how do we check that? What happens? What are the causes? First of all, normally this loosening happens within the first month or two of the surgery. Okay, it's often because it's not seated, right? There's bone in the way, or it's not tightened enough. So it's loose, patient gets a bit of bolus of food or a brush and now it loosens up, or the patient starts functioning on it, right? Healing abutment's too high or oftentimes the temporary crown is not fully out of occlusion, or the patient starts occluding. And you know me, I like to blame patients for everything. So I'd tell the patient it's your fault anyways, even if it was mine. So prevention. Adequate selection of the height and width of your healing abutment. Okay, so make sure you select an adequate height and width. Make sure you remove bone around it to be able to seat it. So when you're seating your healing abutment, you shouldn't have to tighten it in. You should be able to feel it go in nicely and then stop. Okay, and again, depends on what implant system you're using, but for hyacinth, you should be able to tell that. Okay, you can confirm it with a PA, but sometimes it's hard to see on a PA, so I'll even take a bite wing to ensure it's fully seated, so it's better. I'm hand tightening. Okay, so make sure you hand tighten, but remember what your implant torque was. You don't want to torque beyond that, okay? But hand tightening it, okay, will hopefully help to prevent it from loosening up um, as opposed to, um, you know, just forcing it too tight. Um, and sometimes what can happen is, again, that pressure with the bone can start causing it to loosen. 
Uh, managing occlusion well, making sure that the occlusion, that you're out of occlusion. So this is a case where the healing bump is not seated. So again, you'll see these little ledges of bone on either side of the implant. By removing that ledge, you can then go ahead and seat your healing abutment. Now remember, if you use a taller healing abutment, the taller the healing abutment, the narrower it stays. So you can always go to a taller healing abutment if you feel like it's not seated. Okay, so this is a nice picture I actually got off of uh, Dr. Kim, Joan Kim. He's an oral surgeon. Um, and uh, it was a nice diagram. I've never seen this before, but it's really cool. It's with the hyacinth system, you know, when the healing abutment is not seated, you'll almost see like this angry face, you know, with the mouth open. And when the healing abutment is seated, you'll see that there is like a, like, you know, a smiley face almost, right? Like he's happy. So that's kind of a cool technique. I didn't realize that, but if you look closely enough, you can see that. Um, and one of the ways to remove bone around the implant is using a bone profiler. So the bone profiler can really help to remove the bone. I like actually a uh, surgical length round diamond burr, like a size six, which is coarse, not a carbide, but a diamond. And I put my cover screw on and I shape my bone to make sure that my healing abutment is seated. Because if it's not seated, it's gonna, un it's gonna come out. You're gonna have to see the patient, freeze them again. So why do this? Make sure your healing abutment is seated. So the treatment, if it does happen, and sorry guys, I gotta blow my nose here again. My allergies are acting up. Is, I think I'm allergic to my wife, but anyways. Um, so anesthetize and remove, I'm just kidding guys, I'm just kidding. Um, so anesthetize, you might have to freeze the area and remove the tissue. Um, you may have to adjust the temporary crown. So it flares out too much, then you may, or it doesn't flare out enough. Remember that reverse S curve when we, when we talk about doing immediate anteriors. Um, creating, we may have to adjust that, might have to adjust the bone. Place a taller healing above it, right? make sure it's taller. Um, or, re, and when you retighten it, make sure you're aware of the torque that you put your implant in. So you don't wanna go beyond that. Um, and if it was loose, then you may just wanna put a cover screw in at the end of the day, okay? And if there is infection as a result of it, then you either have to re-graft that area because sometimes bacteria can get into those sites. And these are more, this may happen when you're doing an implant with simultaneous grafting. Okay, that stuff, now the implant, the graft gets exposed. So you might have to remove the implant. So this is a classic case of a one once. My good friend, Randy, he doesn't listen to anything that I say at all. I should not have done an immediate anterior for him, to be honest with you, but I did anyways. Um, he got head butted twice, once by his wife and once by his buddy, apparently. So his temporary crown came off four times even though it was completely out of occlusion. Okay, now you can see the soft tissues over, everything looks okay. So I cleaned it up, it looked okay. There was a large graft on the buckle of this, huge, huge buckle of the hissons. So I put the crown back, he came back, and now look at that. Now I start palpating it, and there's pus coming out of this whole area. You know, for Randy, God bless Randy, he's a great guy, but honestly, he was a pain in the ass. So I had to just take out this, look at that, the implant, none of the graft took. This is how it looked originally. Now all the graft was gone. I took out the entire implant and I replaced it, the implant, with more graft and just a healing abutment this time. And I told him this is his last chance. So, you know, I show him like 300 cases where everything's been fine except for your case. So it doesn't happen very often, but if it does happen, then you may have to manage it by removing the implant if it gets that bad. So excessive pain. What if the patient calls and says, oh my God, you know, I got this pain, it's still going on. So I will tell him all great combination. Um, but the cause is typically, um, well, typically it can occur during the first three to five days, but it can be more prolonged depending on the patient. It's variable. And it really depends on the extent and management of the surgical site. So how we're manipulating the tissues. Do we have vertical incisions? You know, if you have a vertical, the patient will probably have more pain than if you don't have a vertical incision. Um, but it really comes down to how are we going to manage it with, by us, okay? So pre-op, Pre-op medication does help. Ibuprofen or corticosteroids can help to reduce the patient pain uh, post-operatively. Um, good closure, good clean, flat, good closure, and, and um, you know, everything's nicely done. Making sure we're maximizing the dosage, dosages of ibuprofen and acetaminophen. So a lot of patients will come in and say, you know, Advil doesn't work for me or, or Tylenol doesn't work for me. But, you know, are they really following the regimen to maximize the daily dose? And quite honestly, even for large surgeries, this is the combination I'm using and, and it works. Um, you know, narcotics are, are, are rare. I will still give them Tylenol too, 
because I want them to use maybe two of those so they get more acetaminophen, less codeine, and then still combine that with ibuprofen. Um, but the treatment is just what I said, you know, combining medications. Um, assess the timeline. So if, it's, if it happens that you know within the first three to five days, that's fine. That's normal. It should be getting better. Some patients take longer. But if now the pain's going away and now it's coming back, or the infection is coming back, or the, sorry, the swelling is coming back, that would be a time where I would want to see the patient reassess the surgical site. So an increase in pain or an increase in swelling beyond the normal healing period is something that's very important to just kind of assess, okay? Then you just get the damn liners, okay? Where it's kind of like, yeah, 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 everything's gonna be fine. You roll your eyes, you're like, damn, I should have charged them double or triple, or I shouldn't have done the case. I should have sent it to you know, my colleague, one of the colleagues at Odin, <laughs> okay? So very important. Um, to, to just be mindful of that. Now, flap dehiscence, okay? The implant, the bone, something gets exposed. And ultimately, it's the opening of the wound edges leading to exposed implant. And normally, that's your fault, okay? Let's be honest, all right? It's typically from poor release and suturing. It just doesn't look nice and clean. You'll see the upper right, it's just nice, it's clean. I've tested my sutures with a probe. As you all know, I do, or many of you know I do, I kind of pull up on the sutures to make sure my knots are tight. Um, or you're just using like, you know, too big needles. The needles are too large, the tissue's too thin, it's a small site, and now things are, when swelling is gonna happen, because swelling's gonna happen, right? You need to accommodate for that swelling. So again, that's where I say suturing is important. Um, we didn't get passive tension free, so we still got a lot of tension, so things just open up. Again, we've got unintentional vertical, verticals, you know? So I always, um, you know, when I talk about my 12 and a half steps, when we get into our reflection um, stage, you know, we don't want tension on our flap because tear, the tears will happen. And when things happen and they tear in areas, normally line angles, um, those are very hard to suture back. And those are areas where things can open back up again. Again, if you don't have the proper needles uh, and, and material to, to actually suture things back. Okay, so it's very important that you do that. And then, of course, you know, patients moving around, um, you know, that can cause or looking at it or they're trying to send you selfies all the time of what things are going to look like and, you, you know, they open up the site. So um, having a loose healing abutment can also be a cause. All right, so prevention, it's really important for us to perform a proper assessment. And I can't stress that enough, um, you know, of the amount of cratinized tissue, the quality of the tissue, how much space do we need? and being minimally invasive and knowing how to suture, okay? Um, we also need to understand how to do a proper periosteal release. And again, I know Hasham has got some great um, videos that are gonna be Sorry, on how to actually do that <laughs> properly. Um, adequate bites of the flat margin, so staying at least three millimeters away is really good. Tension relieving sutures. So double simple interrupted mattress or oblique sutures all help to relieve sutures. Um, strict post-op and scaring the hell out of your patient that if you open this up, things are going to fail, right? And it's going to hurt and we're going to have to redo this. And then of course, just making sure your healing abutment is tight. Because again, if you loosen things up, then again, that's where the flap is now open and then things can, can get into that area. So if it's small, I normally find no intervention. You know, the flap reapproximates. You just tell the patient, no pulling, no stretching, no smiling really big, you know? But if it's large, you have to really assess it and you have to address, do you have to go back in and open it up? Do you have to actually go ahead and, um, you know, do you, is there a requirement that you would need to actually go in and re-suture? Um, so that's something, and timing is really important, right? So when did that occur? Um, you know, at what point in, in the healing phase and is there anything you can really do about it at this point, right? And sometimes it's just better to leave it. Um, but again, it depends on the, the, the size of the dehiscence. Oftentimes you'd be amazed, the body has a very amazing capability of healing and things will heal, you just may not get the result that you want, that's the problem. Okay, and then the last is paresthesia, nerve damage. Okay, and this is a case actually, um, I'm in Brampton, so I see a lot of work from India, and this was actually just a case done about uh, six months ago, and the patient had bilateral loss of nerve sensation, both sides, and an implant, with, both implants perforated the nerve, and then an implant that was sticking into the sinus about six, uh, sorry, about, uh, 10 millimeters, it was a 13 millimeter implant. Um, and it, uh, so how does that happen, right? Like, I mean, you know, how does this happen? It happens. <laughs> okay, this is, per, uh, you know, or paresthesia from manipulation of uh, a nerve. So this is me just reflecting the mental nerves. You have to know how to do that. 
how to expose it, how to take care of it, uh, even when you're reflecting, not to put pressure on it, right? So um, paresthesia ultimately leads to loss of sensation. That's what it's described as, and we need to be very cognizant of it and ensure that it doesn't happen. But the causes are not assessing the CT, um, you know, not assessing it, not assessing your surgery during, as you're going along with PAs and knowing where you're at, uh, picking up the wrong drill. So, you know, your assistant puts it in the wrong spot and now you pick up a 13 when you should have picked up a 10. You know, knowing your lengths, the Y factors, right? The, 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 the drill tips, you need to know how long those are. And then just, of course, obviously violating the nerves, right? And, and the mental frame and can have a loop. Knowing where that is, um, is important so you don't violate it. So prevention, CT guided surgery, I would say is the best way, you know, because you can map everything out right before. Um, but again, it's just a guided surgery. So you still want to be cognizant of what's going on. Um, you know, assessing the site and taking your time. So again, if you have a case where you're worried about nerve issues, take your time, take PAs. Know and check your drills. And you can take PAs with your drills. So, you know, you have to know the drills you're using. You're doing surgery. You need to know every single thing about that drill. How long is it? What's the Y factor? Everything. Okay. And then having adequate implant inventory. So don't tell me, oh, I placed this implant and hit the nerve because that's the length of implant I had, right? If you can go shorter, go shorter, right? Or using non-end cutting drills. So when I'm preparing canal or inferior alveolar canal, which I will do if it's corticated, I'll use the cast drill. But again, these are more advanced techniques. So treatment, remove the implant, assess the site. If you get bleeding, okay, if you get a lot of bleeding, ask me how I know, okay? If you get a lot of bleeding from that site, you probably hit something not good and it could be the nerve. Or if you get nerve tissue on the end of your drill, again, ask me how I know. <laughs> okay, don't place the implant, close the site, allow it to heal, monitor, map it, you know, all the things that you, they tell you to do and then refer to the oral surgeon. What I like to do is, I think I've showed you guys a picture in one of my other presentations of my mom, you know, and, uh, and she, I rely on her to do a lot of this stuff. And that tends to help, you know, it does, it, it actually helps, not my prayers, but hers. Um, so, uh, again, guided surgery, you know, where you have a case where, you know, I set the safety zone to three millimeters. Um, guided surgery is kick ass, man. I mean, it can really help uh, if, you're, if you're worried or you're just getting into surgery to give you confidence. But this is the actual, if you'll see here right in the middle, there's the implant with the safety zone. And then this is the post-op CT, right? You can see bang on. Like, it's, it's like I'll go back and forth. It's, it's bang on. And again, I've had seven implants in that. Uh, sorry, we did five implants. That's that case that I showed you initially. But this is what the power of CT that it can give you if you need it, okay? So this was a case actually that was referred to me um, by a dentist in Niagara Falls and the dentist uh, had referred him to another dentist and that patient then came to him to restore, but it was a mini implant. So I was then seen because I treated his cousin. It was actually one of the all on cases you saw earlier in the presentation. And um, this is the CT, look at that. I mean, the implant is literally touching the nerve. Thankfully, the patient has no loss of sensation, no paresthesia whatsoever. So now the challenge is implant is there. Um, it's non-restorable, okay? It's like, you know, what the hell are you gonna put on that? That's gonna actually last. You'll see the picture in a second. And thankfully, it's not in the right position. So I had to place an implant on his upper right but the implant, I also wanted to do an immediate in the lower left. And obviously, we have to be mindful of the nerve. So this is what the case looks like. You'll see a huge frenum here. Um, again, a little pin, which clearly is not going to support a crown long term. And um, again, doctors, and I know many who are still doing molar implants on these mini implants. It behooves me. But anyways, um, because that's how much bone there was, right? I mean, give me a break. So, um, so how I treated this case was first I had to manage this. Uh, by doing a surgical phrenectomy. I could have done a laser, but I felt like the surgical is very, very thick tissue. And I had, uh, this patient was sedated, so um, I was on a bit of a time crunch. So I did a surgical um, phrenectomy here. And of course, the phrenectomy, you can't go too deep, otherwise you're now gonna have a fenestration into your flap. So it's gotta be done very carefully. Um, I removed the implant, um, again, unwinding the implant. Okay, so I trep lined a little bit, and then you can see there's a little bit of bone just on the tip. And then I used an apical forcep to un... I didn't want to put any apical pressure, right? So I wanted to remove this by, by applying coronal pressure and untwisting the implant. So once it was out, uh, thankfully the implant was placed too distal and too buccal. So I actually uh, prepared my site. Um, I used a liniment initially. And then I took a guide pin x-ray 
Um, and then we placed our implant and grafted. Okay, and then suture it. So you can see here from the PA, guide pin PA is really important. For me, I know my measurements, three, five, seven, ten, which are the lines on my guide pin. So I'm about five millimeters in. I went in a little bit deeper. You can see the canal. And then I stopped my prep at that point and I placed my implant. And that's a 10 millimeter implant. And then we went ahead and placed, grafted and placed a healing button. I actually got really good stability. And so this is the case post-stop, uh, five months post-stop. You can see there's still an issue with the attached tissue. So at this case, and this is what I like to do. I like to do a free gingival graft after the implant and the bone grafting or whatever I've done is healed. And it's a split thickness tissue and that free gingival graft. And that's just two weeks. I haven't had the chance to see the patient since um, because of the COVID situation. So the summary is in a nutshell, you know, optimize your patient, right? Plan your surgery. So select cases that you feel you're going to be confident with and make sure you're adequately prepared, right? So, you know, don't in the middle of your procedure now go and look for instrumentation and become unsterile or touch your glasses or do these things that, you know, plan your surgery in a systematic manner so you can get success. So when you walk away, and I always call it a test, right? When you walk away from the test, you know that you've done your best. Make sure you can see what you're doing. Okay, a lot of these errors occur because you're, you can't see. Whether it's direct vision, so you can have the patient move their head back and forth, right? Their, head, their, their neck can move back and forth. Or indirect, using an intro camera. Okay, but don't be a bull in a china shop. Because, you know, I've seen some doctors operate, and this is just in our basic program, when they're first starting to do implants, I'm like, whoa, 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 just, just calm down. Like, don't go crazy on the flat. And follow the 12 and a half steps to successful surgery. I think those really will help to mitigate a lot of the stuff that we talked about today. Um, make sure you don't contaminate anything, okay? Um, because that's really important. And manage the patient expectation, right? So a lot of these issues that, or calls that you'll get, can be managed by, by, by right up front telling the patient, you will have pain, you will have swelling, you will have bruising. These are important things to understand. Um, monitoring your patient, so keep a close eye on them. You know, for larger cases, I always see them back one week later, you know, post-surgery, three weeks later, and then my six week, which is a month and a half, and four months. Um, so monitor them closer if you're worried about the case, right? And then take photos of your cases, because without taking photos, you can't learn from uh, what happened and how, how things resolved or how you resolved the case. Um, that's the only way that I've been able to learn from my own cases, not other people's cases, right? My own suturing, my own assessment, and then keep calm, right? Typically, these errors occur because we're either in a rush or we're just scared. Maybe we picked a case that was a bit too hard, um, these types of things. So just remember what you're getting yourself into, okay? So ultimately, plan, prepare, and perform. That's the bottom line. Um, questions I'm going to go through in a second, um, but I did want to um, just let everybody know that we will be having, Hashem has been kind enough to increase our group chat amount. We'll be using his Zoom account. Um, uh, you know, I'm Pakistani, I'll take anything for free. So he offered it to me. Uh, so we will be doing a, a webinar for yourself, the dentist, and your team. I think it's going to be a pretty phenomenal lecture. Many of you have heard Dr. Eckler speak um, Mark Eckler, he's an orthodontist. Um, he's got his, I think his master's in customer service. Uh, he will be doing a team building session for us and uh, starting to develop protocols and these types of things. It's going to be for staff, very motivating, educating, and managing their fear, but he's going to do it for us, which I really like. So if you can get your staff on board, I will send a Zoom link for that. And as you know, our next meeting is actually, our webinar is going to be on May 27th. It'll be on grafting. So if you have any questions, you can email me and I can try to make sure I cover those points like I did today. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll talk about protocols. We'll talk about harvesting and then applications for implant dentistry in particular, because we're an implant study club. How, uh, but I mean, we'll talk about both, just soft tissue grafting in general, but how it applies to implant grafting. And I think we're going to keep it really simple. Um, but hopefully, again, develop a protocol that you can do and hopefully start getting into this because there's a huge need for soft tissue grafting. Um, just, you don't need to confirm anything, so remove this slide, okay? Um, now, for the new year, some of you have been asking me about what's happening with the new year. So the new year, we're going to have eight sessions. This is what it looks like. Our welcome meeting won't be at Lamborghini this time, okay, but we'll find another nice venue, again, depending on what happens. And we have a multiple topics, immediate anterior. Hopefully, we can do some hands-on. I always do a suturing. We'll do a treatment planning course. We always have a business meeting at the end of January, and we'll figure out what that's going to be about. 
Many of you want to learn more about immediate implants and some tips and tricks. We'll do sinus lifting because I think it's a huge component of that, uh, of, being, of treating patients and then full arch treatment options as well because I know now some of you have progressed into doing that. So, um, so I hope you guys like this. I'll send this out on the group chat as well. And the cost right now doesn't cost you anything. Okay, you're already members, okay? But uh, you know, our membership fees um, actually were $17.95 last year, we're gonna stick with the same. And then if you refer a doctor, then you'll get $100 off for that referral. Um, and again, we're not starting till July, so we'll probably figure that out later on. So go to the site um, and uh, check out the Facebook site. And uh, just remember to stay safe. See, there's my email address. And then this is the verification code that I will be submitting to AGD. So one thing I forgot to mention, which I hope is not too late, is that if you have not already um, uh, sent, put in the group chat or in the chat log on Zoom, your name, your email address, and if you can include your AGD code as well, because I will submit this on AGD for you. Okay, so just put that in the chat um, and you need to make sure you have the verification code in case they ask you. And I will send out, as I always do, the CE um, stuff. Okay, guys? So let me just go through some questions really quick here. Is the uh, quick question here? Yeah. Uh, the event is it April twenty fourth or 29th? Oh shoot! Did I write April twenty fourth? Correct. Okay, it is April twenty ninth. Yes. Let me just change that. It is April twenty ninth. So let me just put that out. I will send everybody an email because you guys all get the group chat. But thanks for thanks Hashem for pointing that out. And by the way, this is Hashem who's on the phone. Who's uh, who's been a, a huge uh, asset to uh, everybody here in the sense that he's been running these great, great, amazing webinars. I'm sure you've all benefited. It's on the free Odin webinars, free webinars for Odin um, thread. So make sure you check that out, but that's dentistryacademydtacademy.com. Um, and uh, he's been running some great webinars and he'll be hosting uh, Dr. Eckler's uh, session for all of us. And again, we're probably going to have a great attendance because many staff. Um, did you want to say anything there, Hisham? No, I'll, I'll be posting the link right now. Um, and um, that way you can go ahead and sign up and, and forward it to your staff as well. Um, just because we are anticipating that these that this room is going to fill up very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And this is what this is. You're welcome for all your staff, like, you know, front staff, hygienist, assistant. Um, you know, we're opening it up to everybody in the staff, uh, staff basically. So, so yeah, so I mean, I think um, generally, uh, other than that, um, let me just go through some of these uh, questions here. And um, did anybody have any questions? I'm actually gonna unmute. Um, actually, you know what, let me just go through the questions first. And uh, if there were any questions, and then I'm actually gonna unmute some people because I know there are some people here. I don't see anything uh, on the question tab. So that is, that is good. What's the 12 steps? <laughs> so the 12 steps are basically, um, generally those are going to be, that's going to be a video that Hasham is going to upload to the YouTube Dentistry Disrupted. Um, but for those of you who do, right? Yeah, it, it's already up. I'm going to go ahead and post the link right now to it just oh, to help right. you. Okay, so we had a, I had a webinar that, we, uh, that uh, I did for Hisham's um, uh, organization, and uh, it was on the 12 steps of 12 and a half steps, uh, 12 and a half steps of uh, successful implant surgery. So you can check that out. He will put the link up there. You guys are welcome to look at that. There's also another there's lots of great webinars and, and lectures. There's one amazing lecture by Hisham as well on management. I would definitely check that out as well. And the C credits, uh, for those of you who asked, I will email that on the group chat so everybody is part of our who's part of our odin group you will see that and for that to be valid you will have to have the verification code with you on hand in case they ask okay so i'm actually just going to go ahead and unmute for anybody who has questions Does anybody have any question at all i'm actually going to remute because that didn't work why don't you just go ahead and fire in any questions that you do have in the group chat. So what is the verification code? So the verification code was, and I'll, is going to be uh, April 22nd, APR 20, so let me just put it into here. Okay, so it's APR 22, uh, 2020 Odin, there you go. Okay, so I just put the verification code in the group chat and uh, you guys can just hold on to that. 
Okay, and then if you have any issues, then um, you can, and uh, Hisham was just kind enough to put the link on for the YouTube, and then I believe he also posted the link, which I will also do in our group chat. Um, okay, and uh, I will be emailing everybody the C credit on our, on our um, uh, group chat forum, sorry. Okay. Is it, uh, Raymond, Raymond asks one question here, uh, just, just real quick. Um, yeah, I was just about to go to that, go ahead. Okay, perfect. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say if you wanted to read it. Um, I'm not sure if you're still looking at the screen or not. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Thanks so much, Hisham. So uh, he, the question was, how did you manage that case where there was an anterior implant placed, but I see a sublingual bleed? So that actually was just a stock photo that I took um, uh, where there was a large hematoma. But between me and you, and I do some fairly, uh, and this is from Raymond. So hi, Raymond. How you doing, buddy? Um, uh, basically, um, I don't find that that happens as long as you do a couple things. As long as you reflect a full thickness flap, okay, you expose the site really nicely, and then you close the site and compress the area and ensure that there's no blood pooling, then I haven't seen that ever happen. Okay, so um, again, if you would like to, uh, maybe I'll unmute, see if I can unmute Raymond here for a second. So I'm gonna unmute you, Raymond, here for a second. There you go, Raymond. You there? Oh, you don't have a mic. Oh, what do you figure? Okay, so Flor Florenta, Florenta has a question here. So I'm actually just gonna go to Florenta and I've got you unmuted. You're welcome to share your video, but you had a question? Florenta? Okay, well the question yes. was- Sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. No much appreciated. A uh, question for you. So I don't have PRF. So saying I'm doing a sinus perforation, like, and I still want to place the implant. How I'm, you mentioned the collagen by what? Gel foam or what? Yeah, really, honestly, you could put a bit of gel foam or any collagen foam in that area. But honestly, the implant um, is, is enough to seal that membrane. And the studies show that actually a perforation, if, even if you have the implant hanging in up to two millimeters in the sinus, the floor will actually readapt on top of the implant. If it's more than two millimeters, then that's where you're going to have an issue with possible bacterial contamination of the implant. So I would say you could put nothing. If you want to feel better by putting something in there, it makes you feel warm and cozy. You can. But for this type of case, you would either have to have a six millimeter or a seven millimeter wide implant. And I would try to err on going a little bit wider. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. Perfect, okay, great. So, um, so we have a question here from Rena. So I'm actually just gonna unmute you here, Rena. Okay, go ahead, Rena. Oh, hi. Great. Hi, Rena, how are you? Good, thank you. Good. So I wanted to know that if the healing caps come off and if the patient comes, especially now, and uh, the tissues have, there's tissue covering. Yeah, there's tissue covering it. So, yeah, what would I do? So, incision again and clean, or what do you recommend? So, if there's enough attached tissue to begin with, mm -hmm. then I would actually just take a burr and just remove that tissue. Up. First of all, recognizing why did it come off, right? Was there bone in the way? Like, look at your final PA. Because if there was bone in the way, then you're probably going to have to go ahead and remove that bone in order for it to see. At which point in time, if you did grafting, I would just go with the taller healing abutment because you don't want to go and muck around with your graft at that point. But if, if uh, so it, you could just remove the tissue. If there wasn't enough attached tissue, then I would actually just make an incision. And then I would try to just pull that tissue out of the way and again then use a taller healing abutment if you can um, because again if there was an issue with the seating oftentimes not seating the healing abutment is a result of the mesial and distal bone because it's a bit higher right or the lingual plate which because the buccal bone slopes down the lingual plate um, you know it, it doesn't allow that full seating so i would try to do it as soon as possible yeah mm -hmm. So do you use chlorohexidine to irrigate or anything that we could be doing while we are uh, preparing the site again and putting the narrower solar? Not necessarily. If you want, you could apply a bit of chlorohexidine around that area, but really you're just going to rinse the area out 
and make sure there's no debris in the site and then go ahead. Oftentimes there might be some debris inside the implant. Mm -hmm. So you might have to just flush that out and then just go ahead and place the implant. Okay. Okay. Yeah, oh, sounds good. Okay, no problem. I'm going to mute you again. Um, so there was a question here from Raymond as well. Um, so there was a case where I showed a failed buckle graft and that I had to re-enter to redo the graft. Okay, so by then the implant surface is likely contaminated. Did you remove the implant also then re-graft? So, and then there's another portion of the question. So between me and you, um, adding bone around a contaminated implant is not predictable unless you have an ur yag laser or something like that that can adequately really decontaminate the implant i can tell you having done that multiple times and taking post-op cdcts it's not working in my hands meaning i'm removing it with an eye brush a titanium brush sterile you know saline antibiotic therapy doxycycline or whatever it's just not working to get good bone graft. So I am actually, and the only reason why I attempted to do that was this patient was already in the middle of having her final, his final crown made. So I didn't really want to remove the implant if I didn't have to. And, uh, and, but in that other case I showed you, I did remove his implant, Randy. And that's my preference is to remove the implant, replace it with a new implant and then graft and do something different. Okay. So, he then asked, did you do anything special to retreat the implant surface and regraft on top? So the answer I had mentioned was, I open the site up, I remove any diseased tissue, I then go ahead and use high-speed diamonds to clean the bone around the implant, and then I'll use a titanium brush like uh, uh, the eye brush, um, uh, which I don't even think you can get anymore, but the uh, Strauman has a similar brush, and that basically will help to remove it so it's nice and shiny. And then I'll put autogenous bone on the threads, always autogenous bone. So I'll scrape it from the site. And then I'll put my sticky bone on top of that. And then I'll put a membrane and then close the site back up. So that's generally my advice would be to remove the implant. And I know most people don't like that because you may have already let it heal for a certain amount of time, but that's what I like to do. Sounds good. All right, guys. So uh, if there are no more questions, um, and I hope I was able to cover a lot of points. I think we covered quite a bit in a short span of time. Oh, there's one question from Jemshade here. So considering tissue shrinkage, especially in a longer procedure, when would be the best time to release the periosteum? And if you watch the 12 and a half steps of surgery, I make it very clear that you, this is the problem that doctors have. They do the periosteal release too early the blood pools, and when there finally come time to release the tissue, there's no release because the tissue actually hasn't shrunk. What it's done is you've had you it's reclotted again. So I can see Hasham just sent you the link again, but the best time to do it is during the 12 and a half steps when it says periosteal release. And I believe from what I remember, that might be step, I'm not sure, <laughs> but it's one of the steps. Okay, but it's not at the same time of uh, the initial incision. Okay, um, it's right before we're gonna go ahead and I tell you how to do that, which is basically a nice clean periosteal, applying some pressure to stop the bleeding for a good minute or two. And now when you open that flap, you're now ready to go ahead and do your bone grafting and whatever. So it's very systematic on how we do it. And I advise you to, to listen to that lecture. Um, it, it was, uh, I kind of went through that in a lot more detail with the period. Well, it's pretty much what I told you now. Okay. Um, so did anybody else have any other questions um, or concerns? No? Yes? We're good? Excellent. Okay. Well, this was a bit of a weird option for us doing our meeting this way, but to everybody, I'd like to thank you uh, for attending. I also like to thank Hisham for helping out today. <laughs> I think he was off the clock, but uh, mm -hmm. thanks. Thanks for jumping in there. And uh, yeah. Sorry? Sorry? Glad to help. That was great. Thank you so much for, for putting this together, Izzy. We really appreciate it. That was yeah, awesome. And, and I know that Hisham is working on a nice lecture series as well, which I think we're going to send out on our group chat as well. Um, and then uh, we will also send out the link to the upcoming one, which will be Dr. Eckler's session. So just get your staff involved um, and uh, hopefully they'll benefit. And our goal is ultimately to help calm them down and answer some of the questions Maybe some of the things you don't want to say, hopefully have Dr. Eckler kind of reassure your staff. It's always better hearing it from somebody else 
as well. And I know he does a great job. Many of you have already heard him speak. So look forward to that. Keep sharing the dialogue continuing. I know it's reassuring all of us who are on the group chat. Um, keep, keep our mind off of COVID hopefully and uh, keep our minds still engaged because when it's coming soon, coming, we'll have to be getting back to doing implants and surgery. We don't want to really be out of the loop on that. So, um, so I'm excited. And uh, again, guys, thank you so much for